Welcome to Season 8 of Purposeful Empathy, a show that is dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from around the globe who understand the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. Today's episode is brought to you by Grand Huron International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Thanks so much for watching. Enjoy the show. Welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today I am joined by the fabulous Michael Ventura, whose name is totally awesome. Also, uh, for two decades, over two decades, Michael has worked as a leader and a facilitator and an educator. Concepts and tools from his first book, Applied Empathy, I totally, totally recommend it, have been embraced by all sorts of very influential organizations, including the ACLU, Google, Microsoft, Nike, Goldman Sachs, the United Nations, and even the Obama administration. His work focuses on helping leaders and their teams practice empathy to deepen connection and catalyze change. In his private practice, he works with individuals seeking acceptance and transformation through the indigenous healing tradition of the Nawa peoples and traditional Chinese medicine practice of Qigong. He's led countless workshops, retreats, and seminars sharing the lessons of these modalities to deepen self-knowledge and well-being. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here with you. Oh, so happy. We met in the green room at a conference in Canada with the, the Global Shapers. And I do want to say publicly, you played an important, if not absolutely necessary role um, in getting my book published because you introduced me to someone who introduced me to my book agent. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. For that. I, it, it was my pleasure. It's like the, the easiest thing to do when there's a, a great person and a great idea. So oh, not, not a problem. Sweet, sweet, sweet. So your work is like highly regarded for its ability to help others better understand their like inner and outer worlds. And this is, comes from philosophy and ancestral wisdom and about the important role that empathy plays in our lives. So I'm curious to unpack that a little bit. Like, what did you learn in philosophy and ancestral wisdom that made you understand empathy differently? And why is empathy so important to you personally? Great start. Uh, so I would say self-knowledge and the pursuit of self-knowledge is a uh, area through which a lot of my work has begun. Because if we don't turn the lens inward, and understand the ornate Byzantine workings of our interior self, it's really tough to do that for someone else. You know, I, I often use the analogy of like, let's say you've never lost a loved one and someone comes to you and tells you they just lost a loved one. You can sympathize and you might have compassion, but it's tough to have empathy because you haven't actually had the lived experience yourself. And so to shift into their shoes is harder without a, a variety of things we'll probably talk about later. And so in the looking at ancestral wisdom and looking at all of these older traditions of how we gained self-knowledge through contemplative practices, through meditation, through all sorts of different things, I found that in effect, empathy is as old as humanity. And since the dawn of time, we have been scratching images on cave walls because we've wanted to understand and be understood. And so it is innate in all of us, but it is somehow uh, been sort of conditioned out of culture uh, to, to practice it regularly, at least for some folks. And so it's a muscle that atrophies for some people. And they think of it as a special power or a superpower because it's been atrophied, but it's sitting there dormant waiting to be used. We've just got to wake it up in you. And that's really what this work was about. Beautiful. So I'm just curious to know a little bit more about you on a biographical level, um, about your journey as, um, as a healer. What brought you to these, um, these concepts? Like, do, would you mind sharing a little bit of your backstory? Sure. So um, first I will say you are doing all the healing when you're working with me because I think of it, our job is really just as practitioners. We're jumper cables. We're just helping you reconnect to the things you already have innate within you. Um, I grew up in the great state of New Jersey. Uh, I grew up about 10 minutes from New York City. Um, my father is the second generation of a family business operator and my mother is an educator. And in some way, the entrepreneurial side and the educational side, and my mom's also been a social worker and a, and a special needs development uh, education person and a lot of other things, in sort of the, the early childhood ed space. And so um, I kind of put those two things in a blender unintentionally and ended up where I am. 
the post undergrad life for me uh, began starting a business at 23 with a partner that I had uh, who went to, who I went to university with. And we started the business and from 23 to call it 27, we grew, we got to about 50 people. We had a lot of things going for us, um, but I had no support system. I had no um, real mentors around me at the time. I had no coping mechanisms that were healthy. Uh, I had a lot of unhealthy ones. And so uh, what ended up happening one day was I was changing the water cooler and I just remember seeing white in the office. And, um, and the next thing I knew, I opened my eyes and I was on the floor and I could barely move. I had herniated three discs in my back. And when my back went out, that was my body's basic signal to me to say, hey, you're not paying enough attention to uh, your own well-being and you're burning the candle at both ends and this is not sustainable. And Western medicine, which I am a big fan of, um, but in this particular instance, their solution was going to be spinal fusion and surgery at 27, which did not sound like my first choice. And so before going down that road, I was recommended to also try some Eastern traditions. And so acupuncture and meditation and yoga and other things like that kind of helped me discover the ability to work on myself in a way that I hadn't done before. And within six to nine months, the back pain was almost gone without surgery. And I had since learned that like, that was sort of the, that's the alarm bell that my body lets off um, for other people. It could be something else. It could be a migraine. It could be some other thing that you get that your body's like, Hey, slow down, pay attention to me, take care of me. And so when I experienced that after building a practice for myself for several years where I would just commit to taking care of myself, I went back to those same practitioners and asked them if they would teach me how to do it. Um, and one of them, uh, Master Ru, who is my uh, Chinese medicine do uh, doctor and, and teacher, uh, he laughed right in my face and he said, what do you think we've been doing for three years? He goes, I've been teaching you every day. He goes, this is how it starts. And so it, that began the sort of more formal training. But um, but yeah, you, you're you're a student the second you say yes to the teacher. Beautiful. So you have this like experience of seeing the change in your own physical body, thanks to all of these different alternative medicine forms. Um, I wonder if you could speak to the critic for just a second, because maybe in New York City, it's very common, like you want to kick ass and be high performance. Well, obviously, you have to meditate and find like, you know, some transformative mechanism that you merge. But to, there are some people who still live in this like binary where like it's either woo woo or like KPIs. Right. Yeah. So what what do you say about that? How do you straddle that line? Yeah, for sure. And and it's funny you say that woo woo or KPIs is like the best version of, of, of defining the ends of the bell curve on that. So I often use the metaphor of a car. So let's say you bought a brand new car. It's a great car. You spent a good amount of money. You drove that car home and it's just, it's perfect. It rides smooth. It accelerates quickly. All the bells and whistles are working and you go home and you leave the headlights on and you go inside and you go to bed tomorrow morning. That car is not going to start no matter how good it is. And where in our lives are we leaving the headlights on and where are we draining our batteries and where no matter how good we are on one side, are we still depleting ourselves on another? And so what that work really is for me, and it doesn't have to be to the extreme, you know, living in the jungle and kind of going off the grid to, to uh, you know, find yourself in some very like Carlos Castaneda -y way. It could be as simple as giving yourself some time every day to sit, in silence and just shut this machine down for a little bit and be present. It could be as little as making sure you take a couple big deep breaths every day so that you're not panting your way in and out of Zoom calls and meeting rooms all day, which a lot of us do. And so like little things, right, the, the right food we're eating, all of those little steps to me are what build the foundation so that you can move up the chain into some of those higher pursuits of self-actualization and, and self-development because Last thing I'll say on this, but it's a good example. If we're not taking care of the physical self and the emotional self within us, we're never going to have the capacity to go work on the big higher order stuff. It's like very Maslowian in that sense. Think about whenever you've been at home, laid out sick in bed, right? And you're laying in bed and you feel terrible. No one lays in bed, sick, feeling terrible, saying, I wonder what my life purpose is. I wonder how <laughs> I can realize, yeah, you want to like, drink some tea and like watch a bad movie and sleep, right? You want to restore the machine. 
And so my point is with this kind of work, if we're taking care of that end of the, of that bottom tiers of the Maslowian sense of ourself, our physical self, our emotional self, then we have the capacity to, to move up the chain and work on other stuff with more capability. Okay, so I wanna move on to some empathy stuff uh, and really, and talk about your book as well. Um, but I, I'll just close a loop in something earlier that you said that caught my attention. So when I talk about empathy, I talk about the innate trait that unites us in our shared humanity with the little asterisk without denying or discounting lived experience. And when you said earlier, you know, if you, you know, are having a conversation with somebody who just lost a parent and you haven't, can you really empathize? So I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, does that mean there's barriers between us if we don't have the same lived experiences or how do we transcend that? Mm -hmm. So there are some barriers if we haven't had the same lived experience. And the, the way to transcend that is through thoughtful inquiry and the ability to listen and to step outside of your own perspective and your own bias long enough to really hold the attention for someone else's. And so usually we are, we are so conditioned as humans to want to jump to solution. We hear a problem and we're like, how can I solve that for you? And then we think about a solution. And if you're a leader in an organization, you've probably reached that point uh, in, your, uh, in your career because you're good at solving stuff. And the problem is that that often skips a middle step of deeper inquiry. Tell me a little bit more about that. When did that first happen for you? Is there a way that I could understand that better if you just tell me how to think about it from the way you thought about it the first time you encountered it, right? Little questions like that that pull out something else from someone. What that does is it slows down the efficiency of getting to a solution initially, right? That's what we think. We're like, oh man, I don't need to ask 10 questions. I got the answer to this. I got 20 other problems to solve today. I'm going to get this one off my list. But if we slow down and we ask those questions and we listen, we step out of our own bias and our own perspective, and we hear that person for who they are and what they're going through, we do get pulled and uh, a little closer to them and their perspective. And once we're there, we can find solutions that are actually more sustainable and more effective for them and who they are. Yeah. And you're describing a little bit like the beauty of the design thinking or human centered design process and why it's actually really potent. And I imagine this is where you're calling a lot of it from given your, your background, but I'm curious to know now that you have that um, you know, that tool in your toolbox, how have you applied that to your personal relationships and how has that changed your relationships? Mm -hmm. So I, even my professional relationships are kind of personal relationships, which may or may not be a good thing, depending on who you ask. But I, I try to work with everyone I interact with as a whole person and understand that they have a lot of sides and voices and personalities that um, probably don't all show up in my interactions, but may show up in other places when they're interacting with their family members or you know, an ex-partner or, you know, someone else, right? There's other sides that we don't always see. And so I think what I've been, the biggest motivator for me in this work and what has made me consistently uh, committed to it is my own intellectual curiosity and emotional curiosity for understanding other people and what makes them tick. And so how it has changed in my relationships is that by investing a little more of myself in them, I get so much more back. And by signaling my genuine interest in them, their story, their life, people drop their guard, drop their mask a little bit more, drop their shoulders, right? Just kind of like, okay, let's talk about that. And then we get to a better place and a deeper place faster. And so I've, I've really seen that a lot of my relationships have gotten more rich and uh and personal as a result of a willingness to invest a little more in 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 the person across the room you know and you're not just doing want 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 because i'm going to share with the audience and the listeners here that we have met for maybe 90 minutes um three years ago let's say in montreal when you were giving a talk and um you know, your talk wasn't until a few hours later. So you had a little bit of room before you, you know, you'd flown in from New York or flying home the same day. And you had a little, a little buffer before you got on stage. And I got to take advantage of that buffer. You and I chatted for like 90 minutes. 
And I, I knew of you, your book was out. I, I put you up on a pedestal, like New Yorker mover shaker type of guy, you know? And I really felt that you were super present for our conversation. You cared about what I was asking about. You weren't being flippant or kind of like hoity-toity. You asked questions. So you really do walk the talk. I just want to acknowledge that, let everybody know. Today's episode was brought to you by Grand Here and International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Okay, so let's talk about your book, right? So I'm going to hold that up again. Get your copy, Applied Empathy. If you could see all of the little scritch, scritchies and scratchies in here and little stars, hear what I quote. And I just opened this page, 32. Uh, we even asked if the ability to be empathic could be reawakened, even if it had been atrophied. Yeah, that's just a quote from the book. Okay. Um, you talk about archetypes and their connection to uh, empathic archetypes. So could you walk us through what that work is about, why it matters? Yeah, for sure. So I think about the archetypes as a way to develop empathic versatility. And what I mean by that is there are more, there's more than one way to be empathic. And uh, when you find your style and you find your ways that innately feel natural to you, that's the best first step, but that's not the finish line. My hope is that the archetypes are not a typing tool. It's not a Myers-Briggs or a strengths finder kind of thing. It's more like gears in a car. If you've ever like, if you remember back to manual transmissions mm -hmm. and um, each gear has a function and a reason for being in it. Right. And so in the same vein, shifting in and out of these archetypes, given certain circumstances matter. And so an example of an archetype is the inquirer. The inquirer is a great question asker. To know when to be a good inquirer is important because not every moment calls for deep probing, sometimes uncomfortable questions. Uh, sometimes it really is very valuable and it helps you get that understanding, that empathy for someone else. But other times you might need to shift into the alchemist who cares about experimentation and the, the, the understanding that you gain through the act of experimentation, which for some people might look like failure. Some people might see experimentation that an experiment that doesn't yield a positive result as a failure. And there's this great Edisonian quote that I can never remember, but it's, it's basically like, uh, uh, I didn't fail at making a light bulb. I figured out 500 ways to not make a light bulb before I found the answer. And, mm -hmm. and so empathizing with a problem, connecting with it more deeply, seeing the where the breakpoints were and understanding how to put them back together so that you move to the next step. And that can be true in making a light bulb. That can also be true in building a relationship. Oh, what happened there? I didn't show up the way I needed to. I need to experiment with that differently next time. Maybe I need to show up and be more fill in the blank, right? So there's seven different archetypes. Each one of them are important because when we develop the the comfort to shift in and out of them, we become more well-rounded and more versatile, which allows us to connect with more people in more circumstances. Love it. Love it. So you do a lot of corporate work um, and coaching. Um, and I wonder, you were ahead of the curve to know that empathy mattered in leadership and culture. Um, but I think over the last two years, uh, I mean, I've been paying attention. I've been posting daily empathy posts for nearly six years. And the last 18 months has all been about like how to apply empathy in the workplace. Um, some people still ask me the question, well, we're a high performance culture. Um, empathy is going to totally interfere with that. Uh, could you tell us the power of empathy in the workplace? Sure. So high performing teams are probably already using empathy and not calling it that, but they may not be training it and they may not be building processes and systems that support it. And I'll use a sports metaphor, which I'm not prone to do, but it's a good one in this case. So um, think about any like really famous, effective sports teams. Think about like the, the, the late 1990s Chicago Bulls, right? Winning champion after championship after championship. You can't make a no look pass to someone else running down the court if you don't have that innate sense of where they are, that sixth sense of each other's strengths and skills. And that team is working as not five people, but as one cohesive organism. That is what a high-performing team really knows how to do. They know how to rely on each other for strengths. They know how to backfill each other's weaknesses. They know how to have that intuitive sixth sense of how to show up for each other to get the job done. And so when we practice empathy, 
we create an accelerant on the ability to do that with ourselves and with each other. And a lack of um, concern for vulnerability about where our weaknesses might be. Because if you're afraid to talk about your shortcomings with your colleagues, then they're left to guess. And so by dropping that wall and actually being willing to be vulnerable with each other and say, this is where I could use some help right now. I know you're good at this. Let's do this together. You'll gain the, the, the acceleration over time. It may slow things down in the short because you may need to skill up or you may need to change a process. But ultimately over time, when those dials get turned and those screws get tightened, everything moves much more smoothly down the road. I love the use of empathy as an accelerant. I think that's such a great frame. Um, thank you for sharing that. So can you tell us uh, if empathy can actually be measured and can it be developed? What's, what's the, what's love the that, that question? So um, I get that question a lot, especially from who I refer to affectionately uh, often in corporate settings as the tooth sucker in the room. This is the person who crosses their arms when I come in and they lean back in their chair and they're like, this is like, <laughs> This is some HR initiative. And, uh, and I'm there to debunk that thought and to get that person on my team. And so, yes, empathy can be measured, but I am not interested in putting caps on people's heads and tracking their brainwave activity. That's like, you could do that. That is a way of measuring how people are active in those centers of their brain. But what I'm more keenly interested in are measuring the knock-on effects of empathy. So when we are practicing empathy, what can we have a baseline for and what can we measure over time in an organization to see its effectiveness? So things like retention, things like uh, high performance and the emergence of high-performing teams, things like customer satisfaction, things like, you know, uh, just even profitability. You know, have we, have we been able to increase our profitability based on implementing these, these new tools and ways of working and, and ways of understanding our customers and that product change that we made because we did a better job of going out and eliciting customer feedback six months ago and then took that on board and were egoless about the product that we had created and actually were willing to make those changes because we heard that that's what people wanted. And then when we rolled it out, we saw an uptick, right? Like those are the kinds of things I want to watch over time and see how these little tweaks, these little changes, these butterfly effect moments here actually have a cascading effect later. And okay, we'd be remiss not to say that culture has changed thanks to COVID, right? All this like social distancing and people working remotely. So earlier you were talking really about social capital, right? That exists between people when they rub up against each other and they know where, you know, the, the bulls analogy that you used. Um, what's what what kind of advice are you giving to teams and leaders in order to create that in this hybrid work environment or as people come back and there's been such a distance? You know, what are you saying? So I actually have been pleasantly surprised by uh, unintended consequence of the lockdown and the pandemic that we've experienced. Um, while it has been horrible for all the reasons we know, uh, one thing that it's done well is it has dimensionalized our colleagues. And what I mean by that, up until the pandemic, you knew Bill in accounting who works down the hall. Mm -hmm. Now, you've been talking to Bill for the last couple of years, sitting in his office at his home, and he's got Grateful Dead posters on the wall behind him. And he's got, you know, a, a, a six-year-old kid trying to ride the family dog in the background. And all of a sudden, Bill's this other person that you had no idea about, right? You've got a window into, you've been invited into Bill's home for the first time in your, in your working life together. And so as a result, we have gotten a little more intimate with our colleagues in some ways. And we've been given an opportunity to see them as more as, than just a functional role player in the organization. Now that's not true everywhere and that's not true in all instances, but in, but in many it has been. In other instances where it's been tough, where people haven't, have maybe struggled to make the connection, I think the group that has suffered the most is one that we haven't felt the impact of yet, which is for the youngest generation of the workforce. I'm talking about the people who are probably anywhere from one year to seven years into their career. And the reason for that is because they're missing all the osmotic learning. They're missing the in-between stuff. They're missing the pre and post meeting prep and debrief, right? They're missing and the, the politics. Yeah, and the politics and the water cooler talk and the this and the that. And like, I learned so much in the first 10 years of my career by watching other people do their thing. And they're, they are only getting a curtain up and curtain down on meetings. They're not getting everything that happens backstage. And that's really going to uh, have some uh, deleterious effects at some point later down the line if we don't figure out ways to be better mentors 
and, and bring them along with us, even in a more remote way of working. That's great insight. That's a great insight. I hadn't heard that um, articulated that way before. But now that you've talked about people's purposes, personal lives, I saw your dog walk yeah. by a few times. Could we be introduced to your lovely you sure dog? Sure can. This is Mary. So I have two dogs. Mary, come here, girl. Oh, okay. She's she's chewing on this, which I don't know how she even found it. Come here. Come here. <laughs> she's very no. adamant about staying seated right now, so I'll let her do that. Okay. Um, Mary's, Mary's a wire-haired pointer. Um, she's two and a half, and uh, she has a brother named Daryl, who's 10, uh, who's also a wire-haired pointer. And weirdly... Daryl is Mary's genetic uncle. Um, so Mary lives with her uncle, Daryl. Uh, the, the breeder that we got Daryl from happened to just keep Daryl's sister. And so when we were ready for a second dog, uh, happenstantially, we got one from his sister. So here, here we are in this weird new, new dog family. Is the, is the breed uh, hypoallergenic? They are. They have hair and up fur. My wife jokes that I shed more than they do. Uh, <laughs> and she's probably right about that. Uh, and they're great. They're very sweet pups. We've been very happy with them. They have a lot of personality. Okay. Well, if she changes her mind. If she, get, um, yeah, if she gets disinterested, which will happen in 30 seconds, I'll pick her up so you can see pick her. Up. Okay. Penultimate question. Let's talk a little bit about self-empathy. How can we be kinder to ourselves? Oh man, do we need to do that? Um, so much so. So helping yourself is something I think a lot about. And I, and I often equate it to the sort of two-sided scale that you would see in sort of like the justice scale and things like that. A lot of people give a lot. They give to their families and their loved ones. They give to their colleagues and their careers. And there's a lot that they give of themselves to other people. And when I ask people now, who recharges your battery? Who around you helps put gas back in your tank? And they'll think of a couple people, but usually they'll also think of some things they do for themselves, right? Oh, I have a meditation practice or I, you know, go to the gym a couple of times a week and all of that. What I ask after that is, do they feel balanced? Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you're actually getting as much back as you give? And 90% of the time people say, I give more than I get. Mm -hmm. And so my immediate recommendation to those folks is, are you asking for what you need? And usually the answer is no. Hmm. And so what would it take for you to tell someone who loves you and wants to give much like you want to give and give a lot? Maybe you just have to say, hey, I could use a little more fill in the blank from you right now, a little more support, a little more tenderness, a little more space, hmm. um, a little more fun, whatever it is. But I, I guarantee you, if you ask someone who cares about you to give you something that you need, they will probably meet you there and they will give it to you. But we are afraid to ask. I'm very touched by that. This really speaks to me. So ask for what your needs are. That's good. Okay. Um, Michael, last question. I love asking this question of my guests. I, I, I never know what to expect. It's so much fun. Um, can you think of a time in your life recently, long time ago, small, medium, large, doesn't matter. Uh, anything that comes to mind where you were on the receiving end of what I call purposeful empathy, you knew that somebody was there empathizing, having your back, you know, and what that meant for you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, There's so many that just rifled through my brain. I'm trying to pick the, the right one, uh, or not the right one, but one that kind of speaks to the question's heart a bit. So there was a, there was a teacher I had in my freshman year of college. And he, I grew up in high school, you know, I was captain of sports teams and, you know, student body president and all that stuff, but terrified, terrified of public speaking. And I was able to, you know, do it in small groups, no problem. I was able to do it in a, in a like class meeting, no problem, but put me on a stage and I would be sweating through my shirt. I would be terrified. I would be so self-conscious. And this guy, Michael Bruner, who uh, was my, um, uh, my professor in freshman year who taught um, public speaking. And I enrolled in his class to challenge myself. He, it was, it was a rhetoric class technically. And so we would read speeches and then we would learn how to sort of use that to, to learn how to do our own. Um, I sat with him after class one day and I told him how terrified he, I was of this. 
And he said, we're all terrified, man. Let me tell you about my story. And he told me about how he overcame a stutter and some other things that really sort of held him back as a, as a public speaker and how he found love for the act of public speaking through fighting through those challenges. And he took me under his wing for uh, that semester and we would talk a lot and we would have personal conversations after class about, you know, things I was reading and things he had read before and just was a, a, a really kind and generous teacher who saw something in me that I often referred to as like, don't let someone step in the same pothole you've tripped in, right? And he was trying to help me avoid that same pothole. And I, I'll always be grateful to him for that. Oh, shout out to teachers, aren't they the best? Gotta yeah, love them. Michael, it was a delight to speak with you. Pick up your copy of Applied Empathy, the new language of leadership, Michael Ventura. Really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. Thank, Thank you all you. for watching. See you Thanks next time. week. Purposeful Empathy. What if you had access to your own council of coaches to help you break free from your thinking clutter and make important decisions and liberate you from whatever is holding you back? At Grand Huron International, you get to choose the coach of your choice anytime from anywhere. Visit GrandHuronInternational.com and harness the power of on-demand coaching today.